So there's this story that used to go around when I was coming up. The test pilot who was supposed to come up with the VNE for the Stearman. The Stearman, big, strong biplane. Leaned it over, went straight down, full power, looked up at the airspeed indicator, and wrote down the number, and that became the dive speed. Unlike a Stearman, most airplanes, you can't point them straight down without exceeding the structural limits of the airplane. That's where 23, 335 comes in. So there are four forces that work on an airplane. We have thrust, pulls the airplane forward, drag, that pulls the airplane back, lift, pulls the airplane up, weight of the airplane, that pulls the airplane down. When that steerman in the story is pointed straight down, the forces change a little. Now we have the airplane going straight down. In this case, we have the weight of the airplane that's pulling the airplane forward. We have the thrust of the airplane that's pulling the airplane forward. And once everything stabilizes, once it reaches that theoretical steerman dive test speed, the only force reversing it is drag. So in that case, we know that thrust plus weight equals drag. So in the case of the steerman, thrust equals, uh, we'll say it's something on the order of a thousand pounds of thrust. And we'll say the weight of the airplane, uh, gross weight of a steerman is about 2,600 pounds. So the sum of those two, we'll call it just over 3,000, something like 3,500 pounds. The VNE of a steerman ends up being about 160 knots, equals about, uh, call it 85 pounds per square foot of Q. So that means that if you are going 160 knots indicated and you stick your hand out the window and your hand is one foot by one foot, the force you'll feel on it is 85 pounds. So 3,500 pounds of force pulling the steerman straight down. And we're gonna divide that by the 85 pounds per square foot, 41 square feet. So a, a six foot by six foot board in the breeze equals the equivalent flat plate drag of a steerman at dive speed. That's a lot. Wasabi, for comparison, is just about two square feet. Now, we came about this at a pretty rudimentary way, a lot of assumptions that get to 41, but it illustrates an important point, that you can't just dive an airplane straight down and expect it to stay below VNE, at least in the way that most airplanes are designed. So another story that was going around, uh, we used to modify Swifts in a big engine on a Swift. the folklore around that which you'd say well Bill pulled the wings off that airplane pulled the wings off when you exceed the any why is it that the wings come off so I don't know how you can talk about it and how you can pull the wing off an airplane without using a VN diagram so here's a VN diagram vertical axis is N we can talk about that as G's we can talk that about that as lift and the horizontal axis is velocity so uh, miles per hour so if we just plot the critical angle of attack, right? So critical angle of attack being beyond which the wing stalls, below which you make less lift. So you hold it there at the critical angle of attack and you go from zero airspeed up to a bigger number, you'll end up with a squared term, right? Because uh, Q squares with a velocity. We plot VS, so stall speed of our, our representative aircraft here, VS, that's gonna correlate to one G. Somewhere over here, you get to 4G's, the limit load of our uh, representative aircraft, and that is for maneuvering speed. So maneuvering speed being the speed above which the wing has enough lift to break itself. Dive speed, or VNE, or any of the speeds that we're talking about are over here. So what's going on is you have enough lift left over to exceed the 4G's that your structure is designed for. This area is the dangerous area. So the faster you go, the more lift is available with which you can break the wing. When we say breaking the wing, we're not talking about drag loads on the wing, breaking the wing this way, right? We're talking about breaking the wing this way with lift, right? So the problem isn't that you're going so fast and your steerman pointed straight down that that air force actually crumples the wing in drag. No, what the problem is, is that there's so much residual lift that it doesn't take much, much of a gust, much of a mistake by the pilot to create enough angle of attack to create enough lift that the wing breaks. 
So it turns out you sort of have two competing factors, right? On one hand, you have the pilot who wants to be confident in the airplane. He wants to know that he can push the power all the way up, point the airplane straight down like the guy in the steerman story, and know that he will not exceed v &E. On the other hand, you have an engineer who's trying to design an airplane and make it as light as possible, right? So he wants that, that dive speed to be as close to level as possible because that means the airplane can be lighter and have more margin. So what is the safe way to do it? What's the number in between those two angles? For that, we go to 23, 335. What do you want, bud? Want to get down? The reg says that you establish the airplane at VC. When you put it in cruise condition at the maximum power condition, from that point, you lean the airplane over 7.5 degrees nose down for 20 seconds. At 20 seconds, the pilot can pull 1.5 Gs and they can throw out boards and gear and everything, pull the power back to idle. So what ends up being is this speed right here becomes dive speed, V sub D. V sub D times 0 0.9 gives you V N E. So I know what you're thinking. Part 23 is written for certified airplanes. We're talking about experimental airplanes. Why does this apply? First off, the regulations are written in blood. Second of all, when the airplane is significantly modified, we have to determine whether or not V&E is adequate for the new performance of the airplane because it's cruising faster, because it has less drag, or because it has more power. So we talked about our representative aircraft, right? We're in our nosedive going straight down. We talked about whether or not the wing would fail this way or this way. The fact of the matter is that most likely the wing's not going to fail in either of those situations. The way the re airplane's going to come apart is flutter. Flutter is terrifying. Flutter is an undamped oscillation of some part of the structure. Once that oscillation starts and becomes undamped, typically it's all over very, very quickly. So the stick wrap is a way to check and see how damped the natural frequency of the airplane is at that airspeed. It goes way back. The idea is that by slowly checking air speeds, approaching dive speed. So you'll hit the controls at 100 knots and it'll just go and it stops. At 150 knots, you'll hit the controls and you'll feel it wiggle for a second, right? Showing that it's less damped. So then at 155, you'll hit the controls again and the oscillation will last a little bit longer and at some speed above that, you'll hit the controls and it will not be damped. It will be undamped or divergent and that oscillation will get bigger and the airplane will tear itself apart. You can reach that moment close to undamped and knock off the test and that becomes the fastest the airplane ever flies. Stick wraps are great as a test pilot. I don't really like them. The problem is that when you do that stick wrap, there are lots and lots of frequencies that can be excited by the stick wrap that can tear the airplane apart but that the pilot won't feel until it's too late. And most likely, once the tail flutters, the airplane will come apart very quickly and, and it's very, very hard to get out of a broken airplane. So dive testing is terrifying. Flutter is terrifying. Stick wraps are unreliable at best, but unfortunately the only tool we have. But 23335 gives us the tester a way to confirm that we're clearing only the required amount of the envelope, but at the same time we're protecting the final users of the airplane.